All right, good morning, everyone. So this morning we have a roundtable discussion um, moderated by Jock Reynolds. That will be our chance to synthesize some of the ideas that have come out over the fantastic panel discussions over the last couple of days, and also look forward and think together about the future of our field. This is going to be fun having a round table with five wonderful directors who I know and respect so much, but I just want to offer a couple of observations myself before I ask them to come up, and I'm going to address five questions, one to each of them, and then we're just going to quite quickly after they respond individually to those questions, we're just going to open it up so many of you in the audience, I'm sure, have much to say and on your mind at this point. But I've been thinking about this whole theme of sharing that's, you know, part of our title of this whole conference, and, and for whatever reason over the last couple of days, uh, an earlier point in my life keeps sort of bouncing into my mind, which was in 1983 when I first went to Washington to run the, uh, direct the Washington Project for the Arts and Artists Organization, and for the first time I had to think about raising money and, you know, making a payroll, doing all of that. A friend gave me a book that came out that year called The Gift, and it was Creativity and the Artist in the Modern World, and it was authored by Lewis Hyde. Some of you may have read this book, some of you may not, but the first chapter was a, uh, talks about the notion of how Native Americans back in the early part of American history would get together and sometimes offer gifts to their new you know, immigrants who'd come ashore. And often when these gifts were given at some point, the Native Americans would come back and ask for these things back. And the Puritans were very confused by this, and it, it, it generated a term called Indian, Indian giver, which was not a very nice term, as many of you know in our cultures. But the thing that Hyde brings out in that first chapter was that the Indians had a different notion about what a gift was, that it was something that circulated and traveled and never belonged solely to one person. And that's, I think, something that many of us are dealing with and how we're thinking about passing on knowledge, sharing our collection, and so forth. It's certainly been on my mind as I've watched this wonderful panel yesterday with the students who were talking about their experience of the, you know, curating the uh, uh, Contemporary South African Art Show. Uh, it comes to mind when I think of John Walsh, who's come back and given the gift of his knowledge to the school. It meant so much to him. Uh, it's been very evident to me and the jazz live shows that was curated by students upstairs, both musicians and uh, also uh, photography students. Uh, and those people have again been lovingly mentored by Moline Theodore and Kate Ezra. And, but over and over again, they've shown the ability to bring forth knowledge themselves and share it with others. And that tradition is extremely rich in the world of jazz where musicians have always felt the duty to train the next generation. So just thinking, finally, even on my personal terms, the little show of California art upstairs, uh, the five California artists, uh, Bischoff, uh, uh, Demon Corn, Neri, Park, and Tebow. I have to say two of those great artists were teachers of mine and meant a great deal to me. And amongst that group, three of those great artists were teachers to each other or to their colleagues. So. We're really dealing in a realm where I think all of us are interested in this notion of sharing knowledge, passing it on. And the last thing I'll say about collections, I never planned to be a museum director, and it was very shocking to me when I went back to Andover in 1989 to look at the collection that had influenced me so much as a teenager, and all of a sudden I re realized out of 12,000 works, many of them were in the basement, often never seen, you know, often never really put in play, made truly accessible. And it may raise the question of what does it mean to own this stuff or just say you have it as opposed to really putting it in play and keeping it in motion in the way uh, you know, Hyde wrote so eloquently about the Native American concept of gift circulation, of a gift economy. So think about that as we want to continue our work together. Think about that as I now bring these wonderful colleagues up to the uh, table with me. Now, I don't think at this point I'm going to go into their bios, in their bios, but we have Michael Taylor from the Hood Art Museum here. We have Tina Olson from the Williams College Museum of Art. We have Sharon Corwin from the Colby Museum of Art. We have Tom Lentz from the Harvard Art Museum and Simone Witcha from the Blanton at the University of Texas. So please come up and join me at the table. So, so Michael, I'm uh, 
In the wake of us all feeling great gratitude to you and your colleagues for having organized such a great conference last year at Dartmouth, and which was really the model for much of what's happened here in the last three days, the first question I'm going to direct to you is this. College and university art museums not only actively care for and manage their collections, they also have a major responsibility to serve their students and faculty. How they do so has been, involved, been evolving dynamically in recent years leading many of us assembled here today to conceive of our teaching museums, of places where students are invited to work alongside us and are offered multiple opportunities to directly engage original works of art and then capitalize, do something with them. How do we think this evident expansion of our artistic and educational mission might best continue? And what priorities are you setting forth at Dartmouth to help expand a liberal arts education with a broader range of acting, active learning opportunities? Great. Thanks, John. <laughs> <laughs> a minor question. A minor. Well, first of all, I want to commend you and Pam and everyone at Yale for such a terrific conference. You know, there's so many rich takeaways. I can't wait to get back to Hanover and talk with my staff about what they've learned and, and how they're going to implement it going forward. Um, it's really been a rich dialogue. Um, I think it is, that's a crucial question, and, and, and one of the things I think about is that we've really got our mission right, and as a field, the teaching museum field has really realized that we're not just museums that teach, we are teaching museums, that teaching is at the heart of what we do, it, it, it is sort of part of the fiber of our institutions, every, it permeates every pore. And I could have kissed Martha Tedeschi when she said the Art Institute of Chicago is a teaching museum because I think that shows a, a tremendous shift um, because I think there was a, a, a sort of um, a break between it was like teaching is it, that should be on a, a, a college or, or a university campus and not in a, in a mainstream civic museum. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that if you look at the founding documents of any art museum in this country, you'll probably find the word education in there. And, and we've, we, as a field, we've come back to that. And I think it's so exciting. And none of us have the answer to how you engage with students and get them excited with art um, and how you bring your faculty in. I think we're all using shared practices and, and learning from each other. And every year brings new challenges and new opportunities. But I just think that, that baseline is we know what, what we're in the business of, and, and that helps us navigate going forward. I think that um, in terms of, uh, of you know, this, this sort of question that you're posing, we have to be careful not to repeat the mistakes of the past. Mm -hmm. And I think that while we've got our, our sense of pur purpose and shared mission right, I worry a little bit about the teaching museum in the digital age, and are we in danger of um, missing an opportunity here? And, and let me explain what I mean. I think that, in a way, the, we're going to face online learning. I think online learning is coming, and even though these MOOCs are not having great results right now, they, they're going to improve. And it might be in the future that our students are actually living in India and living in South Africa. And if we are saying that you are going to have a great experience when you come here, we're going to teach you how to learn with, with objects and, and give you these transformative experiences, what do we do when the experience is mediated through technology rather than uh, the student being right in front of the work of art? And so. What I'm hoping as a field is we start to take that seriously. And one of the things I've loved about this conference is so many of the presentations were personal. They were personal story. Your story just now was personal about you, that something happened to you. And, and I think that makes for a compelling story. And, and I think as a field, we're doing a great job of telling our story about what it is that's important to us. So one of my stories is that um, as an inner city kid growing up in London, I didn't have many ex experiences with, with art as a teenager, but one of the things I do remember was the Open University, and it was on the BBC, and I would see TJ Clark 
<laughs> and these were old films, so he was dressed in flares and long hair. <laughs> and he was talking about housemanization of Paris, and he was talking about Manet's Olympia. And I didn't see Manet's Olympia until, you know, five years later, but I was ready for it because of those experiences. So I want us to think about web-based learning. I want us to think about, you know, we know that when we get the students in front of the work, we can have the John Walsh moment. We can, we can really get them excited. You know, Jock, you have this wonderful expression where you go like that, like hooking them. <laughs> and and, and great, great works of art do that. You, you, you just hook the student. If you, if, you know, if, if, you, if you get a group of students and you're looking at Rembrandt prints, you, you, you just see it. You see the, this kind of excitement. So I think I, I just want us as a field to not feel like, you know, there was a discussion the other day about, um, you know, if students or young people are looking at art and, and they're not seeing the art, they're actually doing selfies. Well, I think we have to understand why they're doing that and, and what it is in the digital age that, that is changing behavior and not shut that out and, and say that's different and, we're, and, and we believe in what we believe, so we're, we're just not gonna understand that. We have to really embrace the, the, these new forms of technology and I love that student panel last night. That was extraordinary because straight away they talked about the Flickr account and they're harnessing the tools available to them for the purpose of curating, mm -hmm. and they're leading the way. So, so as I've always said, Jock, you know, what we do is, is it's all about letting go right now, and how far are we comfortable in letting go? And that's why I asked that question about the press release, yeah. Yeah. because you're letting them write the press release. I think that is extraordinary. Yeah. So I hope that helps. Well, thank you very much. You know, uh, I have to tell you, not too many years ago, a student here asked me, what is a typewriter, Mr. Reynolds? <laughs> we had one IBM Selectic at the time. And, you know, it goes to the point that, you know, they literally, in the last 20 years, things have changed dramatically. I took him to his laptop and said, you know, it's this thing that says return and tab, and there used to be this mechanical thing. There was, there was a ribbon, and it was red and black, and he's looking at me like, you know, what are you talking about? Great, <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, well, listen, you know, the two of you, and, and now I'm going to turn to Tina, we're involved in our wonderful collection sharing, where we literally, uh, you know, asked you know, both colleagues in the curatorial and educational ranks and faculty to come and think about what you would borrow to teach courses or a course that otherwise might not be possible. So Tina, my next question is directed to you since, again, expanding a shared vision is the major theme of this conference uh, and we've chosen to help guide the panels and programs offered with that in mind. What ideas have been coming to your mind at Williams in, as to how our field of teaching museums might better support one another beyond the mere sharing of our collections? This is a little bit of a follow-up to what. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jock, and thank you, Pam and Jock, and everybody. I have to second all of that for what a great couple days this is. This is too close. Is it getting echo back? Um, I loved where you started. I loved that you began with the Lewis Hyde example, and I think it's a really, really, it's a great way to um, kind of open up our paradigms up. I think what happens always in institutions and in disciplines is that you get, you get one notion of how things work and the notion that we have, so much of us, is that objects belong to us and that objects travel for exhibitions and, th and that's the structure in which they do that. And I think what was so great about the collection sharing initiative was really that it pushed, our, pushed open our thinking and we began to imagine that collections could move and travel for all kinds of reasons that were much broader than a very specific discrete exhibition. Um, and I know that there were lots and lots of museums that did really imaginative things um, as part of that initiative. What WICMA did was bring in a whole range of objects that really amplified the permanent collection installations, and they did that working really closely with faculty. So we had this whole kind of sudden um, enlivening of our collection, and the collection was suddenly bit both bigger and deeper and put in use in this very um, uh, Hyde-like way, Native American mm -hmm. gift exchange kind of way. Um, so, building on that, I think there's incredible um, opportunity to borrow objects um, for curricular and study uses, mm -hmm. to simply have objects moving around for gaps or for particular courses or for particular 
student uses um, and do that in a, you know, it, back to the idea of being agile and nimble, and we keep talking about that. I think it's going to come up throughout this uh, morning in terms, of in terms of all kinds of things, but, you know, how do we make ourselves nimble enough to both protect objects and to more easily have things moving around um, and have things moving around outside of an exhibition that might take a year or two or three to put together. So I think that's one big thing to think about. And then once they do move, they gain so much, right? Like we've been talking over the last few days, a couple of people have brought up this idea that the object has this long social and intellectual life and that it accretes meaning. And we know that that's true. We especially know that that's true in, in museums like ours. <laughs> So how do you, what do you do with that, right? If an object moves to a new place and then has a whole new context and a whole new set of students and eyes looking at it, how do we make use of that or new conservation information that comes with it when it moves? And how do we keep that alive and moving between institutions? So I'd say that's one other, another kind of layer um, of that like movement of objects. And then I think the third, um, the third is to think about really strategic ways in which we might collaborate on things that we otherwise just can't do. So, for example, and Sharon, might, you, might, you might follow up on this, um, but uh, the Deputy Director for Curatorial Affairs um, at WICMA, Lisa Doran, who is here in the audience somewhere, and Sharon and others have begun to really brainstorm and think about how we might share new media and video work, work that otherwise we can't singly do, or at least a lot of us can't, um, and share the, you know, the, the technical apparatus that goes along with that, share equipment. So, you know, how can we do better together collectively what we can't do alone um, in terms of objects? And then I think it's, I think it's really building on, I think there's lots of opportunity to really build on experiences like these in which there's so much knowledge and expertise in among us, and we come together once a year and we learn a lot, and that's great, but there's all kinds of ways that we could be sharing around professional development. I mean, and those could be very structured or they could be very ad hoc. We could have, you know, we could recognize that certain institutions are really, really good at certain things. Yale's really, really, really good at gallery teaching. You know, can certain museums embed folks, you know, just, you know, here, come to my museum and spend a week and you can learn about how we run our curatorial meetings. It doesn't have to be big. It could be big, but it could also be really small, something really, really, really like a very particular skill. Um, I think that's something that we can kind of uniquely do because we have very overlapping sets of, of skills and expertise that we're looking to strengthen. Um, so, so I think it's around objects, I think it's around ideas, and I think, it's, I think it could be around skill strengthening professional development. Great. And that's just, you know, then we should hear from everybody else. Great, great. Well, thank you, Tina. Sharon, um, my next question is addressed to you, and it's that many of us attending this conference work at museums that collect contemporary art and thus provide us with opportunities to invite living artists to participate actively with us, our students, and faculty members. One of us on this panel, you, is a director of a campus museum where an entire new wing has been devoted to the work of Alex Katz. Others of us have been collecting the work of selected living artists in great depth. What are some of the advantages and challenges of doing that? Right. Well, thank you, Jacques, and thank you, Pam, again, for the invitation to be part of this and for such a stimulating and exciting conference. Building on your conference last year, Michael, this is really a great continuation of that conversation. And I think it's, you're really asking what is the role of contemporary art in the College Art Museum, the University Art Museum, which I think is something we've touched upon throughout the last two days. And um, I think that's something we think a lot about as part of our mission. What is our responsibility to the living artist? What is our responsibility to our audiences in terms of presenting contemporary art and interpreting it? We know from the focus groups we do with students that they're, that's what they're interested in. They want to see new media. They want to see contemporary artists at work, they want to hear from them, um, and I think what we have found by collecting an artist, um, not just Alex Katz, we have the complete print archive of Terry Winters, we have a very deep holdings in Richard Serra prints and Saul Lewitt, um, but in Alex Katz's work in particular, which as you point out, we have an entire wing devoted to it, over 800 works of his, so real depth, I mean 800 <laughs> works offers you a real view onto an artist's practice is in many ways what that can offer students as um, instruction on process. And um, I think what you get to see when you look at an artist's work in that kind of depth, with that kind of breadth, is really an artist working out, experimenting, oftentimes failing, 
um, sometimes succeeding, often succeeding. Um, and I think that can be really instructive. We, we actually teach a writing course in the museum as part of the writing curriculum at Colby. And one of the points we try to make is this, this point um, in the, the lesson of revision and iteration. And I think when you can show a student the length of a practice and a process um, and that it doesn't just happen, you don't wake up in the morning and then in the evening have your product, your paper, or mm -hmm. you start in the evening and you have it in the morning, as is often the case <laughs> with undergraduates. <laughs> um, but that, um, that artistic process, um, creative process, writing process, takes real work and it takes iteration, it takes revision. We, um, this is related to, to that point, we, when we were doing our expansion project, we did an exhibition of um, the architectural concepts and design that went into that building. And the architects, instead of presenting final plans for that building, presented the concept and design and process that went into making it. And we actually brought the writing students down to share that exhibition with them. And you could see the architects, they were working out through the models. They had six different models until they got to almost the final one. And you could kind of see the light bulbs going off. It's like, that's what it takes. It's, you know, it's an iteration. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I, I guess my, my point goes back, goes back to that as a lesson that can be learned through mm -hmm. real depth of practice. Um, I also, you know, I think one of the, one of the challenges is to how do, you, how do you contextualize contemporary art within your larger historical collections? And that's something that we have begun to try and think about more creatively, um, to not just sequester the contemporary art off in its own galleries, but are there places where you can integrate contemporary art with your historical collections in ways that might be instructive for both the historical work of art and the contemporary work of art? We recently did a thematic hang of our permanent collection, and um, we're looking at the, um, the, the subject of childhood. So we had a Dawood Bay photograph of a young child on a bike and uh, um, a Copley portrait of a young girl. And there was something really great about putting those two works together. So um, thinking again about contemporary art uh, in dialogue with, with its mm -hmm. history, um, drawing upon it, and then um, having historical works inflected by mm -hmm. contemporary practice is I also think quite mm -hmm. um, instructive. And, and it's, um, it's sometimes where you get that hook for the student. You know, the Copley, oh, you know, you see the students <laughs> glazing over. Copley's great, um, all you Americanists out there. <laughs> but, um, but when they can see Copley through a Dawood Bay, they, they have a different avenue in, which I think can be really yeah. um, eye-opening and instructive. Yeah. Yeah. Great, thank you so much. Tom, I'm gonna turn to you next uh, with a question. All of us participating in this roundtable conversation are working at museums that have either recently finished a major facilities and or re reinstallation project or are in the midst of completing or planning one. What new facilities within your Harvard Art Museums are deemed to be essential additions specifically created to expand the capacities of your educational mission? And how are you working to ensure that these facilities will be sufficiently staffed and funded well into the future? Can I, can I just say I'm really tired of talking about the building after 10 years? <laughs> I feel your pain. <laughs> <laughs> I know you do. Um, I'll just start off with the ritual thanks, Jock, to you and Pam for bringing us all together. And um, like everyone else up on this panel, I've been quietly stealing ideas left and right. Uh, but um, I just wanted to say something I think I said to you earlier, which was, the panels have been terrific, but what I found especially moving yesterday was the student panel, to see young people empowered like that and motivated in very powerful ways. That was uh, quite moving, I thought. So uh, I just wanted to say uh, thank you for bringing all of them together for us. Um, in response to your question, um, we're like everybody else. We have a specific set of circumstances. We have our own needs and requirements. Um, uh, we've been at this at the Harvard Art Museums now for about 10 years, and we have literally taken everything apart, physically, structurally, operationally, conceptually. Um, uh, 
We've, we've tried to think long and hard about what we can contribute, not simply to the university, but to the greater Boston community. Um, uh, this is a little bit different from New Haven, but um, in Boston we actually inhabit, we're part of a very rich, complex museum ecology, and Harvard itself also has, I think, nine other separate museums. So we have to take all of that into account. Um, we spent probably, before we even embarked on this building project, I think we spent close to two years just essentially pulling over to the side of the road and thinking long and hard about what we want to do, what we can contribute, how will we do it. Um, and obviously out of that process, everything involves students, faculty, the community. But there were, I think, three sort of simple, to my mind, goals that came out of that process. And one was to make our collections far more accessible than they've ever been in the past. Uh, we also wanted to put them to work for all students, faculty, and the community, not simply the specialists we always have and always will train. And third, and perhaps most important, we wanted to do all of this with models, mechanisms, strategies that actually encouraged collaboration, working across different fields and disciplines, and ultimately using our collections in more imaginative ways. Um, I sort of joked about, I'm tired about talking about the building, which is actually true, but um, <laughs> I look forward to the day when we don't have to talk about the building, when we talk about what actually takes place in the building with our collections. Um, as I said, we all have different needs. We have different circumstances, uh, both historical and, and current. Um, we have uh, put in place what we think are a number of rather distinctive platforms. Um, uh, perhaps the most distinctive is something we call the Art Study Center. We've dedicated about 5,000 square feet at the top of our new building to this idea, and it's not a new idea. It's, uh, it's the idea that in many ways loops back to historically what has been important to us as an institution, and that is a kind of almost religious belief in the power of original works of art as teaching instruments, notwithstanding the role of technology that we will obviously not only accommodate but embrace and the other is uh, the power of the value of sustained, close looking and observation. Those are our, in our DNA, they're part of our, our history. Um, so this art study center in many ways loops back to those ideas. Um, it's simply a physical space, a physical arena where under close supervision, students, faculty, classes, even members of the public can come and request a work of art and have a very different experience uh, than walking through the galleries or sitting in a classroom looking at PowerPoints or slides. Uh, we're not saying it's better than those other experiences, but we know that people behave differently in those spaces. We actually did a study with Project Zero, which is the research arm of the uh, Harvard Graduate School of Education. And, I'll spare you all the mind-numbing details, but they basically said what takes place in a study center is what we call high-end cognition. It is the gold standard in terms of learning. It is less mediated, it is more participatory, uh, it's more physical, it's more tangible. And we knew that already in many ways. Uh, we know that in study centers people look longer, they look differently, they tend to look more deeply. And uh, so in a sense, it's almost a kind of art on demand model for us. And it's in many ways a kind of opposing uh, model from open storage. Uh, but it's something that uh, we think is important for our future. We also have uh, three 1,000 square foot curricular galleries. These are galleries installed in concert with faculty for faculty and student purposes. Um, we have something called the Lightbox Gallery that sits right at the top of our facility. It's a public gallery. It's a space for new media, uh, for digital technology. We're actually working with something called the Meta Lab at Harvard, which is 
It's a kind of teaching and research unit that is dedicated to advancing network culture through the arts and humanities, and they have something called the Digital Problem Solving Initiative. So they've actually assigned to us a team of graduate students, I think, from uh, the Graduate School of Design, from computer science, and they will help us program that space. Um, we also have something called the Materials Lab. Um, uh, it's probably the same thing here at Yale or any other university campus, but uh, at Harvard now there is huge interest in what they now term material ingenuity. Uh, the properties, the potentials, the limitations of physical materials. And uh, to our great delight and surprise, uh, many parts of the campus look to the art museums and their collections because, as we all know, artists are historically great innovators. They like to do things with unusual materials. And so all of a sudden we have people like uh, marine biology, and uh, I didn't even know Harvard had marine biology. <laughs> And uh, the engineering school, very interested in works of art for reasons of structure or surface or uh, you know, other elements. Um, these, these will be spaces, uh, that one in particular, where visiting artists, curators, conservators, faculty, students get together to explore these issues. Um, we also, um, uh, I should also include in this, um, overly long response to your question, um, our conservation laboratory. Uh, we have the oldest art museum research training conservation facility in the country. It's a big part of our operation. And they actually sit at the top of our building. And I've unfortunately, or maybe fortunately, worked at a lot of different museums, but I've never seen a museum where conservation, conservation science, and curatorial practice are so closely interwoven together. So I don't think it's any accident that conservation sits right at the top of our program, right in the center of our program, and we want to, in a sense, double down on that strength that we have. Um, and I'll just conclude by saying these physical spaces are wonderful. That's great. I, we think we can do interesting things. Uh, we think there'll be engines for collaboration, but in some ways, the most significant thing we've done with our physical facilities is change our staff structure, because our old staff structure uh, would simply not fit into this new model. It would essentially be like putting a square peg into a round hole. So we fundamentally reorganized our curatorial staff to encourage more collaborative work, more uh, cross-fertilization, uh, more focused work. And we also created uh, something new called uh, academic and public programs. And obviously, we looked very closely at what Yale had done. But this is a new department for us. It essentially replaces our education department. And we made what we thought was an important decision up front, which was not to make it a sidebar, not to put it over to the side. Uh, but it's actually part of our curatorial division. And they work closely with our curatorial staff to essentially put together interpretive strategies for the museum, how we're going to use yeah. the collections. Wonderful. And that's the last thing I'll say about Great. the building forever. Great. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you so much, Tom. And it's the perfect segue into your talk to the question I wanted to address to Simone on behalf of all of us. Uh, and the, here it goes, Simone. I think we all know that the recruitment, hiring, and support of excellent colleagues is ultimately the most important responsibility of a museum director. I think we also believe that those of us leading museums now need to strive to be deft, what I call curators of people, not just able organizers of exhibitions, grand acquisitors of art, and aggregators of knowledge. Could you state some of the criteria you bring to hiring new members of your staff because you're clearly doing a remarkable job in that regard? And are there specific competencies you seek and require for those who will be working closely with you, your students, faculty members, and professional museum colleagues within such an acting teaching environment as you now have at the Blanton? I'm thrilled to, to answer the question. And Jacques, thank you um, as well for inviting us here and Pam for organizing this. And I'm really proud that there's so many UT students and uh, faculty here and for inviting us all. So um, I do think it is an incredibly important role for the director. I see my job, and perhaps it's from kind of my experience, is 
creating the environment for good work to happen. That's my principal role. Mm -hmm. um, in doing that, I'm also very aware that I need to have the people that I think have the capacity to do where I want the museum to go. And um, I had a bit of a luxury of building a team um, for the next phase of the museum. And um, I'll talk a little bit about kind of what I was looking for in building that team, but I don't think it really has specifically to do with just, you know, while I had that luxury of building a group of people that worked very closely with me, it's probably something I've carried forward always in looking at teams. Mm -hmm. um, Obviously, they need to be a good fit to where I think the museum needed to go. Um, and I also think that there's kind of a motivation and um, desire if you're going to work at the Blanton specifically, and I'm sure at any institution, that, that um, institutional desire to help build something. Um, the museum has two kind of fundamental purposes, in my view, is... Um, we have the works of art and caring for the works of art, um, and we have the people whose lives we're trying to transform. Um, but it's the engine, um, the heart of the institution are the people who are there. And it is how you create your identity, it's how you get to where you're going. Um, and to me, that is the most distinctive part of any institution are its people. Um, for me, intellectual curiosity, kind of what made people qualify, um, is something I look at very seriously. And intellectual curiosity goes beyond art history. Um, that art history knowledge was vital if they're going to be the people developing programs, developing exhibitions, working with um, our students. But kind of broader curiosity about the world, even a finger um, pulse on contemporary culture is important. Um, intellectual rigor is something that also mattered deeply to me. Um, I'm a very rigorous person and I like to be in a room with everybody a lot smarter than I am. Um, and the um, kind of for our curators and our senior educators, for the museum specifically wanting to make sure that we are on a national platform and by that is not just that we're having an impact but we're also kind of learning from is that they actually be out in an international, national network of people. And I can underestimate that, especially when you're in a place um, like Texas, that there be that connection. Those are kind of basic qualities of, of mm -hmm. you know, uh, capacity. Mm -hmm. But I'd say perhaps what is even more important to me is the kind of manner or style of an individual. Um, those are kind of baseline. Those are that, that was a necessity. Um, for me, um, one of the things I would listen for very carefully, and I always listen for very carefully, is that people care deeply about audiences and they care deeply about education. And education, to me, doesn't necessarily mean um, just talking about something and assuming someone else is gonna pick it up. Um, mm -hmm. It means actually caring about an individual and mentoring in a very deep way. Um, and I think that comes from a kindness and a generosity. Um, so that generosity of spirit is something that's incredibly important to me. It's important to me in the museum. When I feel that that is going in a way that I don't like it, I, I, I step in. Um, and my <laughs> colleagues have heard me um, do that. Um, the spirit of an institution needs to be a nurturing one, especially I think all museums should, university museums or non-university museums. Um, the desire for collaboration, and I was so thrilled to hear the students yesterday talk about that. Um, and by collaboration, um, is comes back to that generosity spirit. You know, it, for the museum to function well, it's a lot of different people with a lot of different backgrounds, have with different mandates. Um, sometimes those mandates are completely opposite. If you just put it in kind of a list of duties, they they sometimes are polarizing to ultimately get to the end goal, we have to figure out how to work together. And there has to be a respect that you're not always going to be right. Um, there has to be a respect that you're willing to actually learn that someone else has something of value to say. Mm -hmm. um, and to me, that's the essence of collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, all of that, for me, ultimately is leading to one goal. And this is something I feel I've always instilled in colle colleagues that work with me, teams that have worked with me, the students I hope that are working, and we have a lot of students at the museum who are working or volunteering in different capacities, is understanding that each of us are um, 
a small piece of getting to one larger goal. Mm -hmm. For me, it's not about me. It's not about the work I'm doing. It's not about the work you're doing. It's, it's about what we're trying to impact. Mm -hmm. um, it's the impact on other people's lives that matters first. And mm -hmm. understanding how you fit into that mm -hmm. is essential. Um, and whether it's you know kind of an assistant in the, in the marketing department, understanding how what they're doing is not just a task to get the job done, um, but the larger purpose of the institution mm -hmm. at every single level is important to understand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think being able to have those skill sets to bring that together um, and the institution that allows you to mm -hmm. see that um, and, and feel it and make mm -hmm. that difference, I think, mm -hmm. is important. Great. Wonderful. Thank you so much for these five wonderful responses. Now, we've got a, we've got a good hour and 20 minutes for you to just fire away from out there. So those mics are available. and. Uh, Please pepper this panel with as many questions as you want to deliver, having had a few days to really load up. Oh, yeah, yeah. Build upon what Simone said and what I've observed here, which has been so inspiring. And if I had to take one word to describe what I've seen here, Jacques, in terms of you and your staff and what you've created here, it would be delight. There seems to be such a delight that everyone here takes, you laser focus on mission. But the delight that you take in seeing your staff do their jobs, the delight that the staff takes in each other's work is so inspiring. And I think that if it can be about that, um, there's a sense of play that can lead to creativity, all of that. But, um, but I re I, that, that's been so inspiring to me and I think um, speaks yeah. to real leadership. So thank you for yeah. modeling that yeah. so beautifully with you and your staff and everyone here at Yale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, think, I think it's palpable here. Yeah. 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 It is. yeah. But it comes from the very team building that Simone just talked about. No one, you know, you get much too much credit as a director. I think we all feel that, you know? I mean, you sort of set the stage, you know, and then if you've hired well and put a great team together, they do the work. And a lot of people don't realize that if you give away power intelligently, in the best sense, you gain a greater power that you're, is what you're seeking for your institution and its mission. And some people just don't get it. Yeah, and, there, there's, and, something, yeah. there's something energizing about a, a kind of collective effort. Mm -hmm. I don't want to sound like an ex-Soviet or anything, but it's, <laughs> but, but it's true. It, it's kind of empowering, and uh, you know, it's collaboration is embedded in it. And you can do very different things yeah. when you work together. It sounds yeah. like such a simplistic thing to say, but it, in many ways, it's the hardest thing to yeah. achieve. Yeah. Okay, thank you everyone, and we're, who has a mic out there and ready I've, to go? I've got the mic. <laughs> okay. Uh, good morning. Uh, my name is Jody Seasonwine. I'm currently the uh, Mellon Curatorial Fellow for Academic Programs at the Princeton University Art Museum. And I want to thank you so much for sharing all of your stories and for everyone sharing their stories about some of the wonderful things they've been doing in their museums. My question is more towards um, when we run into some barriers. Uh, I work a lot with faculty and students in the galleries, and I found students are always willing. I joke that I'm going to throw them in the deep end and ask students who are not art historians to confront works of art, and they always rise to the challenge, and they are happy to take that risk, maybe because they're not in their classroom, and being in the galleries frees them to take that risk. But my question is more about um, encouraging faculty to take risks. I've had a number of inst uh, instances where I've uh, asked a junior faculty member, an assistant professor, a dynamic teacher, to think about doing a deeper collaboration with the museum, be it an exhibition proposal or creating a new course around the collection. And um, in two separate instances I can think of, the professor said to me, come back after I have tenure mm -hmm. and then we can mm -hmm. talk. And so my question really goes to institutional barriers to risk taking, mm -hmm. and these faculty feel that not only would it perhaps take away from their time working on things that count towards their tenure file, but maybe could even hurt their chances of getting tenure because the institution um, does not honor work in a museum as something that's considered on par with publishing their book or the kinds of work that they need to do to get tenure. So I'm curious to hear from you if you've encountered similar institutional barriers to risk taking and what suggestions you would have for those of us in the museum to help transform our institution's culture to really embrace us as partners and value the work that we do and that their faculty do. Thank you. 
Well, I thought I, I think I'll take a crack at that, and then I'm sure there'll be lots of others joining in. Um, for one thing, I think thank you for the question. I think it's a really, really great question, and I think it also speaks to the broader way in which we talk a lot um, about our unique capacity to take risks, right? Academic museums, college and university art museums, because we don't have a gate, and because we're all about learning and. I think we don't talk as often about the barriers to that, to actually fulfilling that potential, right? And I think you're right. I would agree that, that one of the barriers or the barriers can be faculty, frankly. Um, and so I guess what I would say, I'd say a couple things. I, I think one is, like, the best strategy that I've seen and that we've had is by modeling it. And so finding partners, faculty partners, who are just temperamentally, intellectually more risk-taking farther along in their careers, have less at stake, whatever, whatever that is, right? And doing things with them and then crowing about them. So then publishing, publicizing it, talking about it, getting up at the faculty meetings and stroking them, all designed to give people permission, give them permission to, to follow that path. So I think that's, that's like a really effective one. And I think the other one is really to position the museum as a place where students and faculty can make mistakes and, and, and take risks and to kind of treat it as a kind of liminal space where you can do that and so really announce that that's what, that's what a museum can do and let them claim that. So the point of what they're doing is not that it's going to be a tenurable project. I mean, I guess that would be another strategy we could talk about is how do you get museum work and practice to have more, to, you know, to, to have more credit within the academic system. That would be one strategy. But the other one that I'm really speaking to is the way in which you really say, no, like what you can really do here, which you probably can't do within the curriculum as easily, is you can play and you can explore scholarship that otherwise might you might not be able to do, or you can explore ways of teaching that you think might not quite make it. It can be a kind of testing ground. So those are, those are kind of my, my two ideas. Someone else want to take that? Well, i just say that, um, and I don't think this is particular to Harvard, but I think it's in many ways especially prominent there, although it's changing now. Harvard has historically had very much a kind of alphanumeric bias. Um, you know, the notion that if it's not a text, if it's not a number, it's somehow suspect as a form of knowledge. And that's changing very dramatically now at Harvard, but it's, uh, it's very much been a part of our history. And we've been trying to make the argument that, um, you know, works of art are actually very powerful teaching and learning resources. And, um, uh, oftentimes they're beautiful things, oftentimes they're not, but in reality they are the physical embodiment, the materialization of ideas, values, traditions, emotions, attitudes. And when you begin to look at them from that perspective, especially within the context of a university, I think they can be very powerful things. I'm assuming our campus is just like all of your campuses, uh, especially in terms of the debates now going on about uh, the nature of pedagogy. Um, my very strong feeling is that at the beginning of the 21st century, when the visual is so privileged, art museums within the context of a university have enormous potential. And it's just, I think a lot of the struggle is getting people to recognize, especially faculty, that works of art can be much more than simply an illustration. That's the thing that drives us insane. Um, you know, works of art, they're potent, they're powerful, they're active, they have agency, they're a form of evidence. And one of the things we're trying to do is get faculty to understand that you can actually slow down and teach in different ways with works of art. So we're we're very sensitive to sort of trying to, to pace the tempo of teaching and learning with works of art. Mm -hmm. Let me just add to this, and Tom, you may remember this, since you are a Mellon Fellow at Princeton, Tom and I were invited to a con sort of convening of, um, by the Mellon Foundation of 10 of the largest civic museums, I think it was maybe three years ago, or oh God, it's more than that now. But Harvard Neal was invited to participate in that meeting, and at one point, uh, they asked them where these other big civic museums, where are you finding your young curators and where are they coming from? And I'll never forget that Rusty Powell from the National Gallery piped up and said, you know, I look every year at all the CVs from CASVA, the art historians who come to us, 
And frankly, we never seem to hire any of them because they've never worked in teams with other people. They've been so narrowly trained that they don't have this experience of the kind of collaboration and willingness to take a certain kind of risk on these trajectories to get a degree where you tunnel in for you know a particular kind of knowledge. Not that that's bad, but it doesn't seem to be the model that's producing this, the young people would best thrive in our institutions. And I don't know if anyone wants to follow up on that or whether that's helpful to you as a response. Well, um, I, I just wanted to offer some strategies that we found fairly helpful at Colby, and that has been to partner with other organizations on campus. So for instance, the, we have a new Mellon-funded Center for Arts and Humanities in which we're running, we're co-organizing labs in the museum out of that. So faculty can apply to the center, um, receive faculty development grants, and run their classes, their labs in the museum. We also have strong partnerships with the Center for Civic Engagement. And so somehow by forming those partnerships and collaboration, faculty are given a kind of legitimacy or um, the work that they're doing is supported by another um, part of the campus um, organization. And I think that's been highly successful. I also just want to point to the work that I found um, to be a really great model for this, which is the work Ian Barry is doing at the Tang. When you begin to think about your faculty as um, partners in intellectual production, and so going to them early on and working from their expertise, uh, again, it's probably hard to engage pre pre tenure faculty in that. But like Tina says, you can model it from um, the more senior faculty down, and I think really um, thinking about that pool of um, faculty as resources for the intellectual production that we do in museums is, is, a, is a great model. Sure. Yeah. Uh, here, I'll add um, from a large public research university's perspective, um, the campus at UT, uh, we have 50,000 students on campus and um, a lot of colleges um, and there isn't such a thing as a kind of faculty club, it's, it's hard to find your way around a campus like that. Um, one of the areas that I very much wanted to strengthen was our impact on, on campus, and one of the first things I did was actually meet with many of you um, to get your ideas and see what was happening. Um, but another thing I think that was pointed out is, is um, especially in a large campus, kind of finding, the, finding a hook or a center and then building from there. Um, and in a sense, we're, I feel like we're continuing to do that. And one of the hooks that for at UT was just remarkable that it exists, one of the reasons I love working there is a new program was created um, a few years ago called Signature Courses at the university. Um, there are undergraduate courses, freshman courses, which um, every student is required to take. Um, distinguished faculty that are training students in a very kind of unique cross-disciplinary way to um, get, give them the college level skills um, in research and writing and discussing and speaking. And it's cross-disciplinary, it's out of the classroom often, and so we realized they're doing exactly what we're wanting to do. Um, we now have 2,000 students coming through the museum with faculty through that program alone and 20,000 students total coming through the museum. Um, but modeling, kind of picking them as partners and then being able to say, you know, look what they're doing, um, modeling it from there, kind of, you know, get a few wins in your pocket and, and build from that. Um, on a similar level, we now are kind of trying to target different departments. This last year, we just hosted the math department's faculty annual. Every faculty on campus has their little gathering. We let them have their party at the museum just so we can get them in the doors and see them. You can't do everyone, so we kind of go through departments um, in, different, in different ways. So in some way, it's almost like cultivating relationships and, and opening the doors and letting them see how you can have an impact. I would just add briefly the, um, my advice would be to play the long game and if you have pre-tenure faculty, they, their responsibility really is to focus on their research and get tenure. But that doesn't mean that you can't build relationships with them and show an interest in their research, go to their lectures rather than just expecting them to always come to the museum so that when the faculty member has tenure and is ready to really engage with you on a project, you are, um, you've primed them to, to really experience the museum in a different way. And I think that that um, approach um, is difficult 
because you know the short-term gains are so easy. You know, you, you, I can think of a new faculty member at Dartmouth who um, is especially interested in um, images of war, and we have a fabulous collection to teach with that. And she's dying to do an exhibition, but she's got to get ten tenure first. And I think that you ha you have to kind of just think about the long-term benefits. And actually, Jim from the Ashmolean did a great job of talking about that. I mean, sometimes it's a cup of coffee and just showing that the museum is open and available. And the barriers that exist, that's, that's just, you know, you have to find a way uh, to solve that. Because ultimately, I don't think there's anyone uh, who teaches on, on college and university campuses that can't work with museums. I, I think we have something for everyone. How about another question? Here we go. Here you go. Hello. I'm Lucy Oakley from the Gray Art Gallery at NYU, and I wanted to let you know that a couple of years ago with Helen Evans, the great curator of Byzantine art at the Metropolitan Museum, and I co-authored for the College Art Association new guidelines for tenure that included a strong recommendation for university departments to include museum publications that have a scholarly bent in their tenure decisions. So any junior faculty who are expressing concern about tenure issues might be told that these new guidelines are encouraging their departments to include any uh, publication that they do with your museum hmm. in their tenure uh, assessment. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you for that. Yeah. Very good. Everyone bear that in mind. You know, can, can I say one other sure. thing? The other thing I'd add to that last question is we, we want to serve everyone on campus, but at the same time, we also want to be thoughtful about who our partners are. The thing that scares me sometimes is that university art museums can simply be seen, seen as a kind of service center on campus where we simply fetch things for faculty. We want our faculty to understand that museum curators and educators can help guide them through collections mm -hmm. and see things that they normally wouldn't see from their own perspective. So, um, as I said, we look carefully for the right partners. Uh, you were, somebody was just talking about working with a faculty member on an exhibition. That's going to be a big part of our future, but we also want good faith partners. Um, uh, we have lots of conversations with faculty members who have, you know, it's like any college campus. There's no shortage of good ideas, even brilliant ideas. But when we hear things like, um, and by the way, I'll be on sabbatical next year and I won't be answering my email. Um, that, that strikes us as not a good faith partner for us in terms of putting together an exhibition or a research initiative. So um, I, I just wanted to throw that out as a kind of cautionary tale. Yeah, yeah. Thanks, Tom. Go ahead. Hi there. Um, my name is Alexa Miller, and I actually have one more comment in response to that question, because it's, it's such an important one. I encounter that issue all the time as an independent consultant who works at a lot of sites in higher education. And I wanted to give a shout out to Megan Voiler, who I think is in this room. Megan, are you here? She's, uh, there. She's over there. She's at University of South Florida in Tampa at the Contemporary Arts uh, museum, and they face that issue. Um, she's working on an incredible project with, uh, between the museum and all of the schools of health, nursing, medicine, pharmacology, mm -hmm. social work, um, on a new program. And Megan did something extremely innovative in response to that challenge, which was she enlisted the help of um, an organizational psychologist who is working very hard to get tenure to actually be the prime researcher on the impact of this program. And let me tell you, that person is extremely energized and motivated around getting the right data um, out of this project because she intends to use it for as part, to, as part of her research for her tenure case. Mm -hmm. And it's just a brilliant example of a, a really a win-win situation because as museums, we have to partner with, with social scientists, as my colleague Dabney Haley talked about yesterday, to show our impact. And that, that's a resource that's right there. So I just wanted to mention that. Although, you know, on a more positive note, um, I think about this all the time. As 
university art museums, we can call on intellectual and research resources that very few museums in the world can. We have special relationships with faculty. We have bright, hardworking, ambitious students. Mm -hmm. So we're actually in a very, very good position. Who's up next? Someone have a mic out there? Hi. Um, I'm Ruth Slavin. I'm from the University of Michigan. Uh, and having had the benefit of being there for a long time, I have many, many relationships with many different faculty and diverse disciplines. And I wanted to speak to the related issue of how museum culture could assist university culture, and specifically in the humanities. These are not my ideas, they reflect conversations with faculty colleagues. First, the, create, the recognition, full recognition of the creation of art as a formal, as research and as discovery for our, our art school colleagues and to support them in that. Second, um, enhancing the culture of collaboration in academic humanities. Many young faculty don't, also don't get credit or, full, or they won't be tenured if their first book or their second book is a collaborative project. Mm. The creative and collaborative nature of museum work could be a model within the university, and I think people in positions of power and leadership at university museums could enhance that direction in the humanities specifically. Yeah. Um, next, joint appointments um, of key faculty with museums so that their museum work would be fully recognizable for tenure and that it would be part of the negotiation of their hiring contract. Um, and so those are some ideas yeah. that have been batted around at Michigan. Mm -hmm. Great. Yes. Thank you very much. I think I'll, I'll take a crack at that, partly because Dartmouth hired Michigan's provost to be our new president. <laughs> and so a lot, a lot of these ideas are coming to Dartmouth. And um, I mean, I think that one of the uh, key debates happening on our campus right now is around experiential learning and the idea that uh, despite this conference, teaching now is um, an active engaged um, encounter with the professor and the students on the same level, pretty much like uh, we were doing with the gallery talks, and we're learning together. And um, it involves an element of failure and also an element of risk and an element of reflection. And this kind of learning by doing is transforming higher education. And I think as higher education is transformed, we have to lose the old models. This idea that a collaborative project could not be counted as tenure, it, it just seems from a different century, you know. <laughs> and, and I hope that you know, um, as museums transform themselves, I, I, I think we're going to play an increasingly important role because when we um, hear the challenges that you just laid out, you know, it sounds very familiar to us, but familiar to us from, from the past, not from where we're headed. So I think we have a bright future in, in that regard because I think that the kind of collaborative, interdisciplinary uh, teaching that we're doing on a daily basis is the future of higher education, at least as far as we can, can see it in the near future. And I just think that what it means is we've got to work with our provost, work with our president, work with our deans to educate them. And, and you know it's difficult because they leave, you know, <laughs> as I've experienced. So, so I always thought I was coming to Dartmouth to, to educate the students. I didn't realize that actually probably my biggest role is educating the provost and president and deans to really understand why we're, we're critically important. So I hope that helps a little bit. Yeah. That's, that's an important point, Michael. Yeah, and I think that also that, that, that brings up for me another thread that's really important for us to talk about, and that is the incredible ways in which museums are really well positioned to help higher education as it evolves and all the, the threats and opportunities facing it, and the, the, the places in which it isn't, and really talking, really talking about that very, very frankly as a group, I think, would be really useful. A lot of... A lot of that's come up. I think you know, a lot of what we've been saying this morning and that have come up in the questions are things about the museum's ability to be a place where you can learn experientially, the museum's capacity for risk taking, the museum's nimbleness in contrast to the rigidity of a lot of the academy. 
right? Like those are all things that are incredible pluses and that higher ed is gonna, could, you know, can look to us as, as, as like safety valves for, right? Like ways in which it can maneuver better. But there's also, there's also real risks. I mean, I think that, you know, I think at a lot of, and maybe the audience can speak to this, but at a lot of universities and colleges, when push comes to shove in terms of dollars, it's gonna be the units that are, make, that are bringing in income and that are, that are academic units that, that, are gonna, that are gonna hold, and they'll be looking to cut areas with that, that, you know, that don't produce revenue, frankly, right? Maybe not at all of our, our colleges and universities, but certainly at some. And so I think that makes, that makes me think a lot about the extent to which museums, and we've, we've, we've touched on this too, are at least have a foot in, um, you know, in, 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 in a role as an academic unit, the extent to which museum staff ha are faculty or have part of their positions are faculty, the extent to which we can actually have courses or run courses is all really, really, really important when we think about our own future. And I think those are connected issues because, you know, in, in an economic downturn, we soon learn right. who's What's mission critical and who's nice right. to have, right. you know. And, uh, <laughs> right, that's right. So, so if we, we have to really keep uh, making it clear that we are mission critical. And, and I think that's a, a, a lot of what we're doing here <laughs> is learning from each other about how to, to make that case even clearer and louder and, and more powerfully. <laughs> but I do, I do think that that's something that I think about a lot is the, um, in a way, you know, and it goes back to what you were saying, you know, uh, art is an illustration and uh, we're not in the business of decorating offices, you know, and there are, there are so many sort of mission drift moments where, you know, you've just got to always pull it back to teaching with objects. But going back to the, the main question, I mean, I think this, uh, one of the roles we play is, is teaching about creativity and innovation, and those have impacts beyond your constituency departments of, of art history and studio art and classics and anthropology. That gets all over the campus. And, and you know, these are critical things being taught right now. And if we are embedded in that and, and part of that moment, we're going to be mission critical. I, there's two, two points I wanted to make to um, that question. One is there, I do think the museum can play um, a role of, especially in a, again, a large campus, of bringing different um, thinkers together. We're going through the process of reinstalling our collection, which um, is planned to happen in 2017, and then we're going to invite you all there to hopefully host this conference then at that time. Um, we've done a series of conversations, um, and this has happened in other realms, but I'll just talk about it in this particular one, where we've invited faculty from across campus to th sit with our curators and educators to think about um, kind of what we should look like in the future. And, you know, one of these talks could be a neuroscientist, a chair of the architecture department, an art historian, um, diff people from different areas of campus. And there's a topic that might be kind of the object in space, like, you know, well, or, or how do we use technology in the galleries? What were the um, issues? And I can't tell you how many times I've heard at those co uh, conversations where they say, gosh, I've been meaning to talk to you for this particular reason, or that wanting to reach out to each other and thanking us for actually being a hub to bring them together to think and talk. Um, and also thanking us for being a hub for their own intellectual um, mm -hmm. stimulation, which is another point to the, the how, how to bring faculty in, mm -hmm. um, being a place for their, you know, we, especially at the Blanton, play a major role in Austin as a, as a kind of a cultural um, and, and a museum for the community, and that includes the faculty as well. Um, another part that I think is important, um, and, and any time those things happen, I, I share it with the provost and the president immediately about that kind of collaborative spirit, which I do think is a, a model for, for other work on campus. Um, to the point of financial strains, um, major public research universities especially, um, and the University of Texas has battled um, a question of kind of the, what, what an education should look like, the role humanities plays in an education, the role of kind of intellectual pursuit and the ability for students to really think broadly beyond their kind of degree that they're getting to get a job. Um, and I think the art museum, um, it's important um, 
a, we play a really important role about the message the, of what we value on this campus, what um, kind of the intellectual pursuit should be, and that broad curiosity. It says a lot about what the University of Texas goals are, its missions, what they believe our citizens should look like. Mm -hmm. And I think that's an incredibly important mm -hmm. large picture message for mm -hmm. our citizens. Um, for me, the students on that campus, I hope they all go into that museum, if nothing else, to become well-rounded citizens and um, our patrons and our visitors of tomorrow. And I think the message that it sends for a university that that is part of our mm -hmm. core value is important, mm -hmm. especially in public research universities yeah. that are battling this mm -hmm. regularly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, I think that's really interesting. I think all of our universities and colleges are interested in training not only you know, wonderfully bright people to have this great liberal arts education or scientific education, but also whatever it is to go out in the world and hopefully become leaders of some kind in their communities where they choose to live. They don't all graduate from Yale and stay here in New Haven, needless to say. So uh, how they do that, you know, is I think really something the administration actually pays a great deal of attention to and our role in helping those people become you know, potential leaders of the future is, I think, really important and becoming more evident than the work we're doing. I have no doubt at all that our current and recent gallery Wordle teachers and undergraduate gallery guides, amongst those, are going to be some of our greatest benefactors, uh, not just in terms of how they go out into the world, but they're going to come right. back. Yes. They have had experiences here that matter so much to them that, you know, they're going to they're be vying to be on our governing boards or trustees in the future. There's no question of it. Um, I, I would also just add the, um, the model of group curating that we saw so beautifully exemplified la la yesterday afternoon in Kate's group's presentation is one that I'm increasingly convinced of is the way, is the model of the future and one that we can really lead in. And I think the way in which we can lead in it is that we have a larger group, as, um, as Michael and Tom were just saying, from which to pool. And um, if we begin to think about including faculty and students in, I mean, we at Colby have begun to work as, um, as a team, uh, as a curatorial team, making decisions about permanent installation, um, permanent collection installation. This is something that we're all doing, obviously, but what would happen if we brought a faculty member or two or three in which to really model, this is what this looks like. You know, when you, when you talk about it abstractly, that's one thing, but when you bring them into the, you know, hundreds of meetings that go into the decisions that make, I think you could really expand uh, their understanding of that as a model, and I think they would also really impact the decisions that you're making in terms of your presentation of the collection. So I'm excited about thinking about that. Students as well, I think there's a way to include their voices. So instead of, um, I guess what I'm saying is kind of merging those teams together in a way that I think could be really interesting and productive. Yeah, great. Yeah. Next question, yeah, Sarah. So I'm Sarah Lynn Reese Hardy from the Spencer Museum of Art at the University of Kansas, and I want to mention uh, something that has to do with the long haul. And the long <laughs> haul um, in a really exciting way because when I got to the university eight years ago, um, I had not been on the job three weeks before I got a call from a colleague who was the director of the Biodiversity Institute. And he said, we, uh, uh, Victor Bailey, the director of the Hall Center and I, have bonded together and we'd like you to join our team. And what, we, what they had the vision for at that point was something called the Commons at KU. And now that partnership is nine years old. It's all three of us. We have a space on campus. Um, we give away research grants, seed grants, we have programs, we are hybrid in that nature. In other words, it's not just the art museum always modeling, always being the initiator, but in some ways, how do you get invited to the party? Mm -hmm. And the party is not always the party on your terms. So what I would like to suggest to all of us is yes, we need to model, we need to prototype, we need to invite, we need to initiate, we, but we also need to be the kind of partners that others wish to invite. Mm. And that has given us incredible yeah. uh, currency at the provost office. Yeah. And when they say the commons, we, we are very, I love your word crow, 
we're crowing about it all the time. <laughs> yeah. whoever, whoever used crow. Um, because when we say the commons, we say, and the commons is a partnership of the Spencer Museum of Art, the Biodiversity Institute, and the Hall Center for Humanities, and we all get bigger. So that has just been incredibly important. Yeah. And so, uh, so to just leave you with this, this has not threatened the uh, identity of the University Art Museum and our role with objects, but it has actually expanded us into a more hybrid personality where other entities begin to see how we can adapt to some of their agenda. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Sarah. Somebody over there. Oh, who's got a mic now? I, I think I'm lucky enough to be holding the mic. Um, and Anne Goodyear from the Bowdoin College Museum of Art. Um, and thank you so much for your comments. They're very illuminating. Um, obviously, one of the very special things that museums do is to provide um, a place for students to encounter real objects which is not um, a typical uh, thing for people to do necessarily in our virtual world. But um, speaking of uh, digitization and, and um, what's possible nowadays in terms of the digital humanities, I wondered if you might each be able to expand a little bit on how you are developing digital resources, um, perhaps to stimulate um, collaboration and perhaps even new publishing opportunities as you reach out to partners across campus. And I know that each of you has given thought to that, but I'd love to hear more about the strategies you're adopting in that area. Who wants that? Who wants it first? Go I ahead, can Mike. take that. I mean, I think that that's a critical question. And um, at the Hood, uh, you know, we are have an ongoing project to digitize our collection. And uh, we're not only thinking of a searchable database, which is e extremely useful, but um, we're working actively. And Kathy Hart, who's here today, is, is leading this charge in um, building a web portal so that our faculty um, and students will have a, uh, an access to the objects in a way that they've never had before. Uh, for example, tracking works that are used for teaching so that you can find a, a faculty member who taught with that object in a class last term might help a faculty member teach with that object this term. And so that sort of uh, idea is to sort of push the collection out on the campus. So I think that's the priority for now. Um, we've worked with the Newcomb Center at Dartmouth on, on an app for the uh, Orozco mural, which was just given by the Obama administration a National Historic Landmark status. And so this, this app was, was a great collaboration. But I mean, my remarks earlier were, were more about the bigger challenge, which, which I think can, cannot be um, solved by one institution alone. I think as a field, we have to think about what it means uh, to be a, a teaching museum in the digital age. And there's huge opportunities, and um, I think that we can solve these together. Right, and, yeah. um, oh, sorry. Oh, no, go ahead, um, I also think this really, comes to the question, Jacques, that you asked about collection sharing. And I think there's a way we can think more innovatively about this. And Anne, I know this is something that you and I have spoken about, about such um, in institutions in such close proximity. But, and I think this goes back to James Shulman's question yesterday, too, about how are digital collections impacting and influencing our work today. And I think it comes down to um, access, but also thinking more broadly about our collections and thinking about academic museums with all of the resources we have, the diverse intellectual resources and the diverse collections more broadly. And if we can use libraries as a model here, I think we've taken a giant step in thinking about, I mean, it's not really interlibrary loan, um, it's not that model, but there is a way in which I think we can release the kind of fetishization of the object a little bit and think about how can we be informed by and educated by the collections at Yale, Williams, Dartmouth, Harvard, UT Austin, the Blanton, and all of us in this um, audience in more productive ways. And I think that opens up, in many ways, it opens up the world of art to all of our institutions in, I think, quite exciting ways. So I'm not sure quite yet what that looks like, but I feel like that's the future. But. Yeah, I would, I mean, Anna, you and I have talked about this too, but I guess I would, I would follow up on, on Sharon and Michael's 
remarks in two ways. Um, I think obviously we all need to digitize and catalog the, our collections, and we all know that. Um, I think the idea of interfaces that actually allow for student and faculty browsing and that publish all of the data that we've got around the usage of objects by faculty is an obvious idea, and we should pursue it. And it's sort of actually something that we, you know, that, that museum and all the museum educators in the room, especially those who've worked on K-12 resources, know that. Like, they invented this idea, which is like, why would you reinvent the wheel and how organic chemistry is using objects if they've done it over there? Like, why are we all doing that on our own, right? Why couldn't we, in fact, collectively solve some of those bigger problems? Um, but the other thing, I think, is that it's really, really hard for small institutions to invest in platforms for online publication, for example. That's the thing that big museums are doing with big funding from the Mellon and the Getty. Um, so there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a really important way in which we should be thinking together about how to co-develop some of those platforms. And I think those are platforms for publication. You know, I think it would be incredible if we had better, more nimble, more robust platforms for student and faculty publication that were digital because we can't all produce $60,000 print publications. And we know that, that, that we, need to invent, we need to invest in those. Um, and I think things like, you know, things like sharing you know, sharing resources, sharing the ways in which we are working with faculty and faculty are working with objects and doing that collaboratively is, is, is another way. And then finally, I'd say beyond collection sharing, it's really, you know, there's ways in which college and university art museums haven't caught up with broader museums in terms of really thinking about online learning as a creative collaborative platform, not just a, you know, not just a teaching one. And so really investing in the ways that students can play and collaborate and tag and do all kinds of giving back to us around objects but around other things, I think is something we'll all be looking at too. Um, I'll add just to it there. Um, the Blanton, one of our top, kind of my top next priorities is to actually strengthen um, the technology and including a lot of what was talked about in terms of the collection as a resource for um, teaching and being able to access and understand what we have. but. Um, there's another layer, and again, each institution is very unique. And the Blanton, you know, we sit on this campus, teaching is core to our mission, important to me. Um, but we also happen to sit in what is now the 11th largest city in the country and the fastest growing city in the country. Um, and we are the only art museum in town. So we play a very public role. Um, we're actually set up to serve both as a gateway to the community as well as uh, impact on campus. And I say that to just give you a sense that the museum um, does have a, a somewhat robust um, exhibition prog program and programs for audiences generally, um, and, and again, core in education and teaching. Um, our exhibition programs, I think, are important. Um, they say something about the research we are adding to the field at large, as a public research university might do. Um, and by that, I mean within art history. Um, and one of the things that I'm really curious about is the fact that we're sitting on this campus and in a city that is vibrant with technology, the kind of next um, kind of center of technology. And what can we learn from that and impacting in that process of developing um, your curatorial practice or education practice? One of the things that I've especially loved is the fact that we have students on the campus um, and they can inform and let us help us understand how they think. Even the conversation yesterday about using a Flickr account um, we hired and just hired a current student who was, while she was finishing her studies, hired her as our part-time person to help us navigate social media. Um, that is the form of communication for students. If we're gonna want mm -hmm. to, students to come in on their own, not mm -hmm. necessarily through mm -hmm. faculty courses, we have to be able to communicate in that way. Mm -hmm. What better way than have a student who understands that so much better than we do do it? Mm -hmm. And she's basically in charge of it. Um, she also happens to have created a Tumblr account called Cave to Canvas that is, has more followers than most public museums mm -hmm. do. 
Um, there's brilliant things that are happening out there. Um, and I think being able to communicate in the way students communicate is really important, and technology is front and center. Um, and one of the things I think that we're not doing right in museums broadly is technology is thought of as at the end. We develop our programs, we develop our exhibitions, and then we think, let's put some, now well, let's make it, to, you know, let's put it in technology. Um, technology, to me, looks like Today, we talk about it the way the typewriter outside of the office um, used to be talked about. You know, we'll send it out and they'll kind of type it up. Um, it, it, it's, that's the way we look at it. We have a technology department and it sits out there. You know, we'll send it to them. They'll type it up and it goes somewhere. Um, but it's not going to be like that. It is, it is yeah. every part of yeah. our being in the future yeah. and yeah. we need to understand it. Yeah. I'd like to address that question more in the context of how we're also collecting art made in the digital age because it's very clear to me, just thinking back to my own youth as an artist, that museums were very slow to pick up on a lot of the really important art being made in the 60s and 70s when many of us got going starting these alternative spaces in, in cities like San Francisco, Chicago, LA, New York, and elsewhere. Now that real estate and the cost of living in a lot of these centers have changed to become very expensive and the alternative forms of production are moving into you know YouTube and all kinds of forms not only because of the technology is there, because of the economics that are facing younger artists. I think we need to be much more open as to what's being created and what is it we're going to collect and start to place our bets on and adding it to the collection. We're here, for example, we've had prints, drawings, and photography together as a department, and we're going to be splitting that up so that prints and drawings will stay together and we'll be founding a department of photography and digital media. And what does that mean? What should we be purchasing? Well, we've been we've had some sort of fairly sure bets. You know, John Walsh gave us a wonderful Bill Viola piece that, you know, he worked on John's, you know, retrospective. We just bought the great Kentridge three monitor piece, an anamorphic lens. So, you know, certain things you can sort of say, well, these are, you, you know, they're, they're going to be here for the ages and stand up. But what are young people making that's of real consequence? How are they sharing their their production and, and how are they sharing even in some cases I know some of our photo students are doing exhibitions of photography digitally online they put them up back and forth adding to them over a two month period and take them off and we're used to going into galleries where you physically see this stuff they're doing it differently so I think this is another place where we need to also invite younger people into the sharing of what they're making much as you saw the, the student curators last night teach us something. We don't know all of this. We have things to learn, particularly those of us who are, are a little older. <laughs> yeah. Let me just expand on that a little bit. Tom Shapiro asked a really provocative question last night at dinner. He said, do contemporary artists need museums? And I, I kind of um, knee-jerkly said, of course they do. But as you're saying, I mean, I think we're living in a different world where there is production happening outside of the museum and asking what our role is going to be mm -hmm. in mediating that, interpreting that, presenting that. It's really an important question, and um, mm -hmm. it's one that I think is um, more complex than at least I've allowed it to be in my thinking. That almost takes me back to the, the Yale Center for British Art, the, the curator talking about the visitor who said, will it be a welcoming experience for me? And, and you know, I think that we will be a relevant um, institution to contemporary artists as long as we're open and not trying to define positions, but but sort of allowing uh, ourselves to be nimble and, and flexible and changing um, constantly as as art changes. And I think one of the the uh, things that I always sort of think about is that innovation happens at the periphery, and you know a lot of um, college university art museums are, are running on shoestring budgets and and performing miracles under very difficult circumstances, but. You know, it's those places that I think are going to be the ones who are going to um, allow artists to direct the the focus of the collection. Mm -hmm. And if we if we aren't, uh, you know, we have to avoid that that mistake of the past. Mm -hmm. And I know exactly what you mean about the the the, the sort of uh, missing the sixties and seventies. I mean, growing up in England, it was amazing that um, even as as late as as sort of the late nineteen seventies. The Tate was still debating whether Picasso should be in the collection. I mean, it's <laughs> unbelievable. <laughs> but, <laughs> Who's that? <laughs> okay. No, oh, whoops, sorry. No, I just have to. I have to add to that because it's so interesting. It brings up so many things that are the thread throughout the morning. Um, I think there's so much in, with, in which 
so many ways in which the production of art now and technology and its and the and the broader culture and the reception of art are really going to push hard at museums and you know I think they're going to push at our a lot of assumptions that we've been making for the last few days, right? An assumption about all art happening, our, our walls and the, the spaces where that, that, that we exist in working for a lot of art, right? Yeah. What does it mean if you're making a work of art that's a meal? What does that mean to your registrar if that work of art is a meal that's, getting, that's, going, to be ha that's going to happen in the museum or outside of the museum? I think it's going to push at a lot of our understandings or notions of what a curator is and what an educator is, absolutely. I mean, my daughter the other day, my 11-year-old daughter, I was looking at Facebook, and she was like, why are you looking at Facebook? That's dead. That's gone. <laughs> and then she said, here, look at Vines. You guys know what Vines, you know what Vines, right? Six-second videos. Six-second videos. So we spent the last two and a half days talking about close observation and long looking, and we're doing it for digital natives who are thinking in six-second increments. And who are spending seven hours a day on, on digital devices. That's what it's right. come to now. NPR, you probably heard that story two days ago. But if you, if you think about it historically, I mean, imagine being an illuminated manuscript artist <laughs> in a monastery, and then Gutenberg, who's hanging out, not in the monastery, but with the winemakers, <laughs> notices the wine press and, and invents the printing press. Well, that... That shift in technology was probably extremely scary, and we all deal as directors with change management. It's one of the hardest things we deal with. And I think that you know, we have to have faith in artists. That shift in technology produced Dura. You know? There's no so question about faith in technology, but we have to be responsive we to have it, to be res and or we're we, gonna be left behind. And so, <laughs> so I, think, I think what we've got to, We've got to embrace is, is that in a constantly changing landscape, we are able to constantly yeah. change. And I'm not saying this is easy at all. I think yeah. it is a, a major thing for our field. Yeah, great. The, the, the only quick thing I'd add to that is that uh, we, like a lot of museums now, have actually assembled an internal group made up primarily of our conservators, conservation scientists, and curatorial staff, and I'm looking at Jessica Martinez, who's head of academic and public programs. I don't think DAP is part of that group. They, anyway, um, <laughs> it's a group that's come together to talk about the issues and problems presented by time-based media, new media, and it's a little frightening when you see the issues and problems that are headed our way. And, I just brought this up because um, after we had a big meeting about it, our modern and contemporary curator pulled me aside and she said, you know, I'm thinking about this. It's got lots of problems. We're not really set up for it. Are you, are you going to back me if we, if, if, if we decide to move forward with this acquisition? And I sort of surprised myself by instinctively, intuitively saying yes without knowing what that really meant in terms of <laughs> you know, financial commitments. But uh, to, to just to echo yeah. what uh, yeah. Tina was saying, if, if we can't adapt and if we can't get yeah. ready for yeah. new works of art, yeah. we're going to be left behind. We're, we're simply going to be, and I'm a picture person, but we're simply going to be museums with pictures and frames on the wall, and that's mm -hmm. not the future. Mm -hmm. But think about how much we've changed already, and, and just this conference, I think, is part of that. If you held this conference 20 years ago, I think the discussions would be very different. Absolutely. Uh, I always say this, that I think a lot of teaching museums 20 years ago were sort of mini Mets, and they, they, they thought that they had a different mission. They, they were sort of community town and gown museums. They, they were thinking very differently. And, and I, I really applaud this shift. And that gives me the hope that we can adapt to change and um, <clears throat> let artists show the way, you know. That's, yeah, that's absolutely. And just as a reminder, remember, it wasn't until just recently that teaching museum was not a pejorative term. Right. The implication in the past used to be it's a teaching museum, yeah. meaning the collections aren't very good. They deal with secondary material. And you know, it's, now we have it's, to say, like John does, a great teaching museum. <laughs> <laughs>
question? Well, uh, well you know, the other thing in this field that's, that I thought about a lot when I was at the Addison was how much the great works were always borrowed from our smaller institutions for the major museums, and there was nothing wrong with that, but frankly, so little ever came back the other way. Mm -hmm. And I remember when I did a retrospective of George Tooker at Andover having th lent 36 major paintings to the Met that they first refused the loan. And I thought, well, good God, you know, after all of this, what is that all about, right? <laughs> and, you know, it was, it, we eventually did get the loan. I won't go into how, but, but, <laughs> but, but you know, it was, it was at that point when I also looked at a number of our institutions where I saw people were sort of yearning to always, oh, if just once in my life I could have a show that would go to one of these places. This would be the crowning thing for someone working at the University of College. I thought, well, God, what a pathetic sense of ambition. Can't we, <laughs> can't we have something more interesting if we were to do more of what we're doing together, which is to combine this wonderful teaching mission and the fact that we're training the kind of people that are ultimately going to end up at these big, big civic museums, which frankly now are not the most interesting places to work, and they're beset with huge financial problems, the monetization of their collections, you know, Boards of trustees, they're driving them all nuts. I mean, I wouldn't touch, I wouldn't touch a lot of those I don't know, places. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, have another question. <laughs> could, could, I From actually, the... could I actually say one thing on that? Um, you, you talked about, excuse me, you talked about how other institutions like to borrow just the cream of what yeah. you have. And that's a huge challenge for us. We have a big collection, yeah. and we're actually thinking hard about strategies, not simply with other museums, but with our faculty, mm -hmm. to get them to not simply skim across the top of our collections. We want them to go deeper, because yeah. presumably we found a good, meaningful reason to bring those things into our yeah. collections. Yeah. And if they're not used, they probably yeah. shouldn't yeah. be there. Yeah. But this goes back to libraries. When I came to Yale in 98, they had just begun to transfer the entire collection off of three by five typewritten cards onto a database. So in the older days, if you couldn't literally find the curator of that collection, or in the case sometimes of the registrar, and Yale was keeping double sets of books, sort of like truckers who want to get through, you know, uh, you know, how were you going to even find out what was there, much less gain access to it, which has other implications for how we've needed to staff up to support a more expanded use of making collections, you know, accessible. And that I think something, but you know, we haven't talked that much about, but a huge portion is not just building facilities, but creating enough resources that you have more art handlers, more registrars, more educators, and people who can deliver these things. Otherwise, it's just a false promise. Question from the back, if we may. Uh, this is Max Marmer from the Samuel Crest Foundation. I, I want to start with a story from the pre-Jock era at Yale. Jock, you came here in 98. Uh, in 95, I had one of the most intriguing professional experiences of my life at Yale. I was on the Yale reaccreditation team and was uh, on behalf of the libraries, and I was astonished, as everyone was, to discover that a university like Yale can be reaccredited, do its self-study, be assessed by an external visiting committee, with no mention being made of the museums whatsoever. Uh, the simple reason for that, and it's, it's unalterable, is that accreditation is all about apple-to-apple -to -apple comparisons, and most schools don't have museums. Mm -hmm. And so museums do not figure mm -hmm. in nationwide reaccreditation processes. Uh, Brandeis was reaccredited, I think, a couple of years before it contemplating selling its museum. There is no mention of the museum in the reaccreditation re self-study. I've done a, a little bit of a study of self-studies. Museums are almost <laughs> never mentioned because they're not asked to be mentioned. Um, and so what I learned from the Yale experience was, thank heavens, the, the library director said, this is absurd. Let's invoke the, the museums as our partners in collecting, stewarding, conserving, and mediating use of collections and you know, the continuity between the Beinecke Library and the museums is pretty self-evident. Um, so I'm on a bit of a campaign to encourage museum directors at universities and colleges around the country, first of all, to find out when their school is going to be reaccredited, because they might not be consulted at all about it. They have their own internal accreditation processes, like schools of architecture, des graphic design, and others. But find out, uh, have lunch with your library director, and make sure they do at least mention the museums as pertinent to the university or college reaccreditation process. I'd also love to know if I could ask a show of hands, how many folks in the room know when their school is next up for reaccreditation? It's about a third of the room. 
um, I think there's a problem, and mm -hmm. I'd love to hear what the director. A, a fifth the of the room. Okay, a fifth of the room. Yeah. <laughs> We're charitable in New Haven. <laughs> I'd love to know what you all make of this kind of situation. I'm not suggesting, by the way, the museum should be part of the reaccreditation process. I think it's impossible, simply because most colleges and universities yeah. don't have them, and the accreditation okay. agencies can't set up those kinds of standards that don't apply across the board. But short of that, and short of the headache of reaccreditation, what can museum directors and their staffs do to at least be surfaced in the process? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think, that's, I think that's really right, Max, and that's a real risk. And um, I think it goes back to what Michael said a moment ago. It's not just about educating the faculty and students about our relevance on campus. It's really the administration. And to make sure you're at the table at that high level of decision making and planning and reaccrediting is so critical or else you've become irrelevant. Um, or you at least your um, role on campus is not acknowledged at that high level. And I think, um, I mean, Jacques, just seeing you and Yale's new president on the stage here, I mean, it's those kinds of relationships that keep us alive in institutions like this. So um, if you don't have them, you're sunk. Mm -hmm. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you. My name is Amanda Cross. I work for Bright Spot Strategy. We're a consulting firm. And actually, in addition to working with Ruth on the University of Michigan's Museum of Art's um, strategic plan, we had the pleasure of working with um, the University of California's Santa Cruz New Institute of Arts and Sciences with John Weber. And I wanted to try and touch on the conversation of engaged learning and in attracting faculty. And so if you don't know, the, muse the Institute is not a museum. Um, it's very much trying to be an intercept of a museum and a place for students and faculty to collaborate over interdisciplinary studies. Um, and in coming up with its vision and its plan for the facility, we brought together faculty across the institution. And the, what came across and the conversation we had and what I really am interested in hearing from you is the intercept between making and viewing and what needs to happen in the building and else, elsewhere on campus and online to attract faculty and students away from the other places that they have to create things together and exhibit things together and whether those things can happen in the same place or they can happen in isolated places. Tom, you mentioned a number of labs mm -hmm. and um, dedicated places in the Harvard facilities. Yeah. So, whether in the future you see those things really intercepting yeah. fully or yeah. um, what role they have in the yeah. art museum. Let, let me take that one because I'm an alumnus of UC Santa Cruz and actually on the Dean's Arts Council that, that generated this project. And just, sorry, Ian, but we stole John away to help run that. So you're now doing a great job. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, as a graduate, you know, of UC Santa Cruz, I was in the very first class there. One of the things that was most important to, I think, a lot of us who went there were the incredibly close relationships we had with faculty at the time. First of all, it was about an eight to one ratio in 1965 through 69. Beyond that, it was pass fail. You got written evaluations from your faculty. And early on, there were some major experiments done with undergraduate art education with a huge grant from the Carnegie, grant, uh, Carnegie Foundation, my senior year, that allowed people from the arts, science, humanities uh, to come to campus and experiment together. And myself and 15 other young students were, didn't know why, but we were asked to be a part of an interdisciplinary experimental art workshop led by Robert Watts, the Fluxus artist. And during that year, we first were visited by Merce Cunningham and John Cage, who did an amazing performance and spent a few days with us talking about chance and improvisation and walked off on mushroom hunts in the woods with Cage. <laughs> and, and, you know, we saw George Siegel, Alan Capro, uh, you know, and, uh, James Lee Byers, uh, Dan Flavin, and it just, the whole year was unbelievable. It sort of blew every assumption you could have had about contemporary art, but it was that kind of experimentation with people across disciplines uh, that shook up, I think, for a lot of us, the notion of what one might do if one were entering the arts that was a little less than just traditional, but more multidisciplinary. So, you know, one of the things I've actually encouraged as alum also of UC Davis is that, you know, we were talking, and others have mentioned library, interlibrary loans, well, you know, it's required by state statute that, that all the UC t uh, twin campuses share their books with each other. A lot of people don't know it's required by statute that they also share their art, but they've never 
ever really created a, a major network to do that. And now Santa Cruz is building its institution, which is so far behind in collecting one kind of work, they're going to concentrate more on the digital and the new. Davis is building a new uh, museum. And Rachel Teagle and John Weber applied to Mellon for a planning grant to think about how the UC system might do what some of us have done. And it's one of my real hopes out of this kind of conferences we're having is that other parts of the country, public or private college universities, will think of other models of what they might do together and that not all of them have to try to do the same thing. Right. So Santa Cruz has this wonderful interdisciplinary thing that's gone on where the sciences and marine biology and all these other things, physics, have been strengthened. And they now, I think, have realized that they need to strengthen the arts and humanities and integrate them. So I'm delighted to know you're part of that wonderful process. But it is a model everyone might want to look at when you think of what does one need to do as an institution which might not need to be done if you complement in collaboration with other potential partners. Um, I think what I might add to that is that, uh, in my view, there are very few universities in this country that have had the kind of generous embrace of the visual arts like Yale. Uh, Harvard has been quite different. In fact, uh, our current president, Drew Faust, who is working hard to change this, said something a couple of years ago that I'd never thought about, but she said, Harvard is good at collecting art, they're good at studying art, but they're not very good at making art. Mm -hmm. And a perfect example of that is the Carpenter Center, which is right next door to the Harvard Art Museums. It's Corbusier's only building in North America, and that's really where the practice of art takes place at Harvard. And historically, there has been very little interaction between two very close physical neighbors, and we have new leadership there now. And um, we see them as really a kind of conduit for bringing in uh, artists, uh, which has been sorely lacking in our past. It's also the home of the Harvard Film Archive, which is one of the great film repositories in the country. We've just built a brand new 300-seat theater that will have you know, the most sophisticated projection system on campus. So all of a sudden now, uh, we, never, we never had a seat at the table before, but now we can actually be a player in terms of moving image. So um, what has always been driving us from the beginning is Harvard has, like all of, a lot of your universities, we have great collection resources, and why aren't they talking together? Why aren't they working together? And I, I suspect that the movement and the directions that Harvard takes will not necessarily be the ones that others have taken, in large part because in some ways we're coming late to the game, so we can't simply duplicate what's already there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Someone else? I have a question. I, oh, go ahead. Oh, whoops, sorry. Uh, Brian Wallace, Bryn Mawr College, um, I'd love to have your president back to the campus to help articulate the role that the visual arts can play on a campus at Bryn Mawr. Um, my question is about um, alums and graduates of programs and how to, um, given the changes in the institutions that we've been talking about these past few days, how we can remain engaged with recent graduates, our own recent work study and other uh, student workers, and longer term, how we can remain engaged with alums from, uh, from prior decades as resources uh, for students as emerging professionals um, and as resources for our own collecting um, and more generally stewardship activities. We have very complicated relationships with mm -hmm. our development departments, advancement departments, mm -hmm. offices of alumni affairs. Mm -hmm. This is an area that's sort of, it's sort of yeah. important tectonically in, this, in the same yeah. register perhaps as, as the, the groups that Max mentioned a minute ago. Yeah. Well, let me take that quickly at the first to say that, you know, these universities and colleges are all good at doing these sort of grand overall class reunions, but what they've discovered over time is that some of the most intense engagement that comes when you bring people back around their central life and professional interests. And so, you know, 10 years after doing the, starting the gallery guide program with Ellen Albert, who's here and others, you know, you invite those students to come back. You create many reunions of the people who've had life-changing uh, situations happen in their education with the institution, and that means we have to devote resources to doing that. We have to find members of our board 
and people who think, you know, not only is it nice to fund an exhibition or to fund a publication, but this generation of, you know, new people who we want to keep involved, that it takes time and resources to keep them together, just as we're finding the value of a, of a you know, group of us here today, that we have to spend the time and the money to make it happen. And so I think it's, it's a great question, and it's one we ought to all ask ourselves, because otherwise people do tend to drift away and get involved in other things. And, we all deal with cultivation. Boy, all of us yeah. up here you know, are stewarding relationships all the time as part of our jobs. But you can do little things. I mean, one thing that we did at Dartmouth was we're very proud of our Space for Dialogue program, which is a 10-hour-a-week paid internship. And at the end of your, your year, it's kind of your culminating experience as a senior. You get to do an exhibition. And close to 100 students have been through that program. And so what we decided to do recently was to offer them free membership of the museum. And all we asked for in return was that they answer a couple of questions, kind of where are you now? You know, yeah. what, was, what was meaningful about that experience? You know, and so in a way it, w it allowed us to, to think about how those uh, Space for Dialogue experiences could be better. But also we're tracking them and we know the famous alums like you know, Max Anderson at Dallas and George Shackelford at the Kimball. You know, we, we, we know those alums, but we've also found that there are a lot of uh, Dartmouth alums, I would say especially after the founding of the Hood in 1985, who've gone on to museum careers, and they're often out there as associate curators in the Midwest or, or, or assistant curators at, at the Guggenheim. And so we've started with our uh, quarterly newsletter to just have a, 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 a sort of alumni voice where we can bring in those museum professionals. And Trisha Paik, you know, recently did a piece on Ellsworth Kelly, and it was really wonderful. And I think, I think those little things can help you so that when you, they do come to the 25th reunion, it's not like they're seeing you again for the first time mm -hmm. and saying, wow, this place has changed. They're actually actively engaged. And that goes back to your point, is, is that if, if you can engage sustained, in a sustained way over many years, they're going to be your, your ambassadors, your advocates. They actually might be the ones who meet the president and say, boy, you've got a great museum. You better support it. Yeah. And, and tell some of the best when they leave that you expect them to want to be board members in <laughs> 10 or 15 years. <laughs> That's right. Uh -huh. <laughs> what, what I'd add to that is, in my experience, um, the thing that really pulls people back is engagement with students again. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe it's because they're reminded of their lives before all their hopes and dreams were obliterated. Yes. But, yes, right. but I, I'm, the, I'm the, joking. But I think you that's mean the part bad John Walsh and the good John Walsh. <laughs> <laughs> but we we work hard uh, to involve students in virtually anything we do that involves, you know, our visiting committee, our <laughs> alumni, the board of overseers, the corporation, because, you know, it's, it's, it's a very powerful thing. It really is. Yeah. I think um, the student um, is what keeps them involved. I think there's another aspect to it, and I hear this often from alums who are involved in their civic museums and their community. It's the idea that we're about learning and they're, they're, them coming back and having an opportunity to continue learning. So I think that um, remembering that, you know, that, that moment of transformation doesn't end when you finish um, your degree. And in fact, you can play the role of, of them always being your student. And I think um, the more time you invite them back and don't just give them information about what you're doing, but allow them to participate in that kind of ongoing education is really um, key right? mm -hmm. and helpful. Okay, I think we have time for maybe two questions, maybe three, and then my eager staff members want to keep this thing on the clock. I know that. If I, if I could just add to that, this is Jessica Sack, I'm here, that we also create a net, I'm here. Um, we also <laughs> allow for the students who've been, especially in the Wordle Gallery teacher program, to be a network for themselves, and that they can be in touch with each other, and as each graduating year, leaves, they can be in touch with former ones and mentor with each other within their own mm -hmm. professions. And so that they connect to us, but they connect to each other. And that, I think, strengthens their desire to be part of our larger community. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great point. Someone else? Yeah. Hi. Hello. I'm Francesca Baver from the Harvard Art Museums. I'm in the Division of Academic and Public Programming. And um, I just actually wanted to respond to your earlier question about the Materials Lab which Tom has already talked about. Um, I'm 
I will be responsible for the programming for that in collaboration with a lot of my colleagues. And the idea is not so much for us to provide another space to train makers, but more to integrate um, the making process into the learning and thinking about art process, very much in sort of following in the tradition that was started by Edward Forbes at our museum earlier in the last century of um, the egg and plaster course, which was really giving people, you know, putting the, the art materials in our audiences and students' hands and <clears throat> giving them a chance to really link that kinetic experience with looking um, and also that way providing them with a chance to ask questions about the making process. And we're hoping to draw on the many artists who come through not only the Carpenter Center, but the university. We have over 100 visiting artists a year. Um, and really bring them and other makers who may be involved with them um, in the collaborative process in sort of thinking about process and problem solving. And um, sorry about the crackly voice. Um, and also, I mean, that's part of it. And also maybe reaching across campus, not maybe, but certainly reaching across campus and trying to collaborate with um, faculty and integrating that into their teaching process and working with uh, the collection. And then I wanted to bring up another thing in connection with the digital tools that we might be thinking about. Um, certainly there's work being done not only at Harvard but at other universities in thinking about how digital annotation might be used as a very powerful um, tool for interactive learning and also scholarship and sharing ideas. I mean, if we think about what's being done already with um, you know, um, interpretation of texts, mm -hmm. um, that we could apply that also to visual materials and create this you know, worldwide dialogue from which we as you know, museum staff um, and researchers could also learn from students and from the public and sort of um, access you know, the kind of thinking that people might have about artworks in, in a much broader way, so. And that requires a lot of um, resources as well because, you know, you need servers, you need people who are going to help to curate that kind of annotation, but it just seems like it would be a very powerful thing to think about and that we could share across, across university collections as well. Can I Thanks. ask you a question about that? Yeah. Is the, is the um, digital production also part of the materials lab? Is the materials lab both physical materials and digital materials? There's, there's the idea that we would also expand to investigating digital materials, but the interpretive, um, as part of the interpretive materials that we're also creating at the museum, yeah. um, we're creating tours, digital tours, and one of the things that a number of us would like to integrate into those digital tours is this ability to I think we're talking about mainly some kind of tablet, some kind of annotation possibility so that the visitor, the student, whoever, and, and professors could be using these too, could um, use that as a, as a tool for dialogue. So. Anyone else out there? Uh, yes. Um, oh, whoops, okay. Is this on? Is this on? Okay. Yeah. I'm Robert Waltersdorf, the director of the Bennington Museum in Bennington, Vermont. Um, by the way, that's a municipal museum, not part of Bennington College, which does not have its own museum. Um, but just two weeks ago, yesterday, we announced to our community that we were forging a new partnership with Bennington College, um, running ahead of, with that without knowing just what that means yet. Um, but one thing I'm really interested in, Bennington College has always been a college interested not in looking back, not at looking at history, but in making and creating. And we've been talking about integrating university museums with, with academic programs, but I'm really interested in, um, in the role of the museum, not just in modeling creativity, but in, in inspiring creativity, in being an engine for creation, and actually an engine also for economic development in a local community. Almost all of you are at schools with great, um, you know, great teaching museums, but with great um, making programs, architecture schools, art schools, um, drama schools, music schools, how are you integrating with them now? And are there new ways that you can do that? New ways different from five or 20 years ago? I, Paul, can I? Go, yeah. Um, I, I 
agree with you completely. We're really fortunate to have um, great, a great collection for the city and an amazing art history um, faculty on campus and tremendous curators. But we also live in a city, in particular, it's very much about creativity, great creative programs, um, visual art programs, and, and music programs. One of the things that we've done is really, um, Austin's known for its you know, music. It's known for creativity bro broadly. We have a very strong music program, for example, where we invite faculty from the music school or also musicians in the community um, to work with in our galleries. Um, they, they perform, they sometimes write pieces, they sometimes perform in response to works of art in the galleries. Um, we've had conversations between um, people of different disciplines. We've even brought in different di disciplines into the museum. Right now we have an exhibition looking at Deborah Hay's work, um, a renowned choreographer, and allowing our visitors to understand choreography and a sense of perception and how, they, how you view a dancer in a museum space, which is a very different experience than sitting in an audience um, with a performer on stage. Um, it, it matters because it does, I think, um, give a sense of uh, creativity and uh, that kind of broad curiosity, again, that I think is really important that I want the museum to instill in our visitors and the artists in those, the art, future art historians and just you know, anybody that's on that campus. Um, and I do think that interdisciplinary approach um, to looking at our work is important for us. And I would just like to address the other side of your question, which was how can the College or University Art Museum be part of the economic growth of the community? And Waterville is a post-industrial, economically depressed town. And if we've, if, as we've thought about changing our profile, it's been incredibly important to us to be part of local arts and economic initiatives that are, re, that are rethinking the profile of Waterville at large. So it's important for us to be part of initiatives in the community to um, make it an affordable space for artists to live and work. Um, as we are bringing people who are interested about art to Waterville, um, we also want to be giving back in a way. So I think you're pointing to a really important part of our mission that we don't always fully consider how can we be part of the economy of our yeah. local community in a way that's not just about bringing artists into our doors and into the, the creativity that happens in our spaces, but how can it be happening in our larger community is yeah. extremely important to our thinking. Yeah, Let me just expand on that briefly to say that there's been a 600 student uh, high school magnet art school built within two blocks of the art gallery at which the Trisha Brown performances you saw some of were performed in that high school two weeks ago and there's a major junior college three and a half blocks from here. Those were construction projects that came out of a dialogue between Yale and the downtown arts area where we wanted students to not have to sign up for you know bus trips that would take forever and permissions to get here. Those students now just walk up here every week often for classes, much in the way our students come from the Yale campus. So this gets into this other notion that we have to be in dialogue with our university leaders, but many of us should know our mayors, our councilmen, our political figures, the major business people in our communities. They all have an interest in raising particularly the, the quality of public education, which is in real jeopardy in our country and all kinds of social and other problems that we, we could talk another whole conference about. I think I need to end this now. We've gone five minutes over, but Pam, do you want to say any concluding remarks? Uh, I want to just commend you and your team for putting this fantastic thing together. Go <laughs> oh, up there, go up there. I really just want to say thank you all so much for taking three days to be here in these fantastic conversations, and I hope they'll continue, and thank you. <laughs>